Hi, this is Sherwin, uh, Approvals Manager here at Vista Laboratories, and um, welcome to another uh, monthly webinar. Today we'll be discussing United States FCC market access, um, talking about electronics, electrical products, and covering aspects of the compliance and approval process in the United States. Um, it'll be a general overview, so um, if you still have any uh, product-specific questions or specific regulatory questions, you can always email us at info at vista-compliance.com. So without further ado, let's begin. So what is the FCC? Uh, the FCC is the Federal Communications Commission. Um, they regulate communications uh, by radio, television, wire, satellite, and cable in all 50 states in the U.S. Um, it's a federal agency, and they're responsible for implementing and as well as enforcing uh, communications laws and regulations in America. Um, and radio frequency devices, as we know, uh, in America are required to be properly authorized under the FCC rules, which is the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, Title 47. Um, and this is required prior to uh, the equipment's marketing or importation into the United States. So the Office of Engineering Technology, OET, they administer this equipment authorization program. And it's, uh, this, is, this program is how um, the FCC ensures that RF devices in the U.S. are able to operate effectively and not cause harmful interference, as well as maintain compliance with the FCC's rules. So there's a few divisions. Um, Policy and Rules Division conducts proceedings to develop policies and rules with respect to spectrum allocation use and equipment authorization and licensed devices. Um, the Electromagnetic Compatibility Division plans and conducts studies on radio wave propagation and communication system characteristics. And the Laboratory Division, which we'll be uh, focusing on today, is responsible for the evaluation of radio frequency devices and other technologies to determine interference risk potential, um, technical operating parameters uh, necessary to comply with technical standards. Um, and also they develop technical standards uh, and recommend appropriate action when there's new RF technologies that, um, that arise. So uh, to summarize, um, uh, electronics, especially um, so there's different schemes, but radio frequency devices in particular are subject to equipment authorization and must comply with FCC's technical requirements prior to importation or marketing. So an overview of the equipment authorization process, we'll be going through an overview, um, talking about the regulated products, the different categories of products, um, testing process, uh, in the actual approval process, we'll be talking about uh, modular approvals. We'll be talking about um, labeling requirements, responsibilities of the manufacturer, and surveillance requirements, um, as well as permissive changes, so changes to the product, um, what to do in that case, um, as well as uh, some new topics presented recently by the FCC. Okay, so what does the equipment authorization process look like? So first we need to determine the applicable FCC rules for your product. So if your product is indeed an RF device, then it is subject to the FCC rules. So we'll need to find out which rules apply to the device. After that, um, find the applicable equipment authorization procedure. So there's two different equipment authorization procedures. One is the supplier's declaration of conformity, and the second one is certification. And after that, um, the actual compliance testing, so performing the required tests to ensure that um, the device is compliant with the technical requirements in the FCC's rules. And lastly, is the final equipment authorization approval part. Um, that's where um, after testing is finalized, um, all the results and um, application forms, etc., are gathered reviewed, and then um, finally uh, a certification decision is made. So um, this is the process that uh, the FCC 
uses to ensure that these RF devices in the U.S. are operating effectively and not causing harmful interference and staying in compliance with the rules. So the FCC has two equipment authorization procedures. The first is the supplier's declaration of conformity. Um, the second is the certification. So uh, supplier's declaration of conformity or SDOC is a procedure where uh, a responsible party needs to ensure that uh, the equipment is in compliance with the appropriate technical standards. So um, it can be a manufacturer ensuring that their own equipment is compliant with the FCC rules. Um, so this responsible party must be located in the United States and they're not required to file an equipment authorization application if uh, going with the supplier's declaration of conformity process. Um, equipment authorized under the SDOC procedure is not listed in the SCC's database. Um, but it's still required that um, test reports or information demonstrating compliance with the FCC rules is available when requested by the FCC. Um, and it's optional to use the certification procedure in place of the SDOC procedure. So uh, moving on to the certification process. Um, so this is an approval process for RF devices uh, because radio frequency devices have potential to cause harmful interference um, to other radio products and radio services. So this is equipment authorization issued by an FCC recognized certification body. So in the US, this is a telecommunication certification body or TCB. Um, through evaluation of the supporting documents and test data submitted by the applicant, um, uh, in this case, the manufacturer or a responsible party, um, the TCB reviews this documentation and um, provides a certification decision. So the testing must be done by an FCC recognized laboratory. Um, and all of this um, technical information, uh, technical parameters and um, descriptive info for the certified equipment will be posted. Um, it's public and stored on the FCC's database. So, um, so which procedure to use uh, depends on the equipment. Um, if it's a radio product, what the radio functions are and the applicable FCC rule parts. Um, so in general, intentional radiators, uh, transmitters are required to be approved using the certification procedure and um, unintentional radiators or uh, digital circuitry is approved using the SDOC procedure. So um, for example, um, mobile phones or laptops, um, tablets, they're a combination of both a radio part and a digital part. So the radio transmitter part requires approval using the certification procedure and the uh, unintentional digital circuitry um, requires approval through the supplier's declaration of conformity procedure. So um, basically if you have an equipment that only has a radio transmitter, then um, you required, you're required to be approved using the certification procedure and equipment that only contains digital circuitry um, would only need a SDOC procedure. Um, some examples of equipment only containing digital circuitry would be um, power supplies, switching power supplies, LED light bulbs, radio receivers, um, etc. And it's optional for um, SDOC approval uh, products to use the certification procedure. Okay, so that was a quick overview of the equipment authorization uh, procedures and processes. Moving on, we will discuss the regulated products. Okay, so um, incidental radiators and unintentional radiators can be approved using the supplier's declaration of conformity equipment authorization procedure. Um, incidental radiators are uh, not designed to intentionally use or intentionally generate um, radio frequency energy. So actually in this case, the SDOC is even optional. Um, unintentional uh, radiators use digital logic. Um, they have electrical signals in the product, but it's not the intent of the unintentional radiators is not to emit the radio frequency energy wirelessly. 
Um, so that is subject to the supplier's declaration of conformity. Um, what is subject to certification? Um, intentional radiators, ISM equipment, and licensed radio equipment. So um, actually ISM equipment, um, which is industrial, scientific, and medical equipment, some ISM equipment can use the SDOC uh, procedures. So um, there's specific rules regarding this. Um, I think it's uh, less below 90 kilohertz and some um, output power range. Um, the ISM equipment can be subject to supplier's declaration of conformity. Um, products that use the licensed radio spectrum, that's also subject to certification process. And as well as uh, intentional radiators, so um, products that uh, emit a radio frequency energy wirelessly. Incidental radiators are electrical devices that aren't designed to intentionally emit RF energy. Um, so it doesn't um, produce any radio emissions above nine kilohertz or cause radio interference. Um, though this, in, in reality, this can still happen, but um, equipment in this category aren't required to obtain equipment authorization. Um, so this is regulated under subpart A of the Code of Federal Regulations, part 15. Some examples are AC DC motors, mechanical light switches, basic electrical power tools, and other electronic electrical products that do not contain any digital logic. So, um, so it's still important that the manufacturer uh, minimize possible interference. And um, you can still actually do an SDOC in this case. And what we've seen is um, applicants who aren't completely sure whether it's purely an incidental radiator or there's a combination with digital functions inside that um, will generally do an SDOC just to be on the safe side. So an intentional radiator is a device that by its design uses digital logic um, and or electrical signals operating at radio frequencies for use within the product um, or it can send radio frequency signals um, to associated equipment that uh, or peripheral equipment um, connected through wiring but um, it's not intended to emit RF energy wirelessly by radiation so um, this is under part 15b and g some examples of unintentional radiators um, coffee pots, wristwatches, computers, telephones, um, garage door receivers, remote control, um, and other electrical equipment that rely on digital technology. Now we'll move on to a uh, detailed breakdown of the products regulated under the certification equipment authorization uh, procedure. An intentional radiator is a device that intentionally generates and emits radio frequency energy through radiation or induction, and it may be operated without an individual license. Um, what that means is um, it doesn't use the licensed radio spectrum, and it's only using the unlicensed frequency bands. So this is under Part 15, Subpart so C through F and H. Um, some examples are wireless garage door openers, wireless microphones, um, Wi-Fi transmitters, Bluetooth radio devices, as well as radio transmitter modules. So um, in this case, the certification procedure is required. So ISM equipment um, or industrial, scientific, and medical electronic electrical equipment uh, provides RF energy for applications other than telecommunications. This is under part 18. So some examples are fluorescent lighting, um, microwave ovens, medical diathermy machines. Um, in this case, uh, SDOC or certification can apply. Um, so these are telecommunication, um, these are not telecommunication applications. Um, so it could be the physical, biological, or chemical um, applications. Um, but it is, um, nowadays we are seeing a lot more uh, medical equipment with um, RF communication uh, um, radio modules. Um, so in that case, then certification would be required. So products that use the licensed radio spectrum, um, this is licensed radio equipment. So some examples are 
um, cell phones, smartphones, base stations, um, licensed point-to-point -point microwave radios. Uh, radio transmitter modules can be both unlicensed or licensed. Um, so th there's quite a few rule parts that uh, regulate this um, equipment category. For example, um, citizen broadband radio service is part 96, uh, broadband radio service is part 27, cellular service part 22, and signal boosters would be part 20 and part 90. So um, licensed radio equipment um, is required to use the certification equipment authorization procedure. So these are the categories that the FCC separates the regulated products into. And this is also the first step. So determine which category your product falls under and determine which equipment authorization procedure to use. So next we'll be talking about modular approvals. So meaning um, radio module transmitters. Um, this can also, uh, these modules are also able to apply for um, FCC grants using the equipment authorization procedures. And these modules can also be both unlicensed um, and licensed. So unlicensed meaning intentional radiator or licensed radio equipment. So modular approvals. Um, so a radio transmitter module can also apply for an FCC grant. Um, it, these can be installed in end use products, um, which we refer to as host products or host devices. Um, and so host products, in this case, they may not require testing or equipment authorization, but it depends on how the radio module transmitter is integrated. Um, module approvals are for uh, modular devices to be installed within a host product or attached to a host product in different or possible physical configurations. Um, this is the singular modular transmitter, um, which is a complete RF transmission subassembly. So this is designed to be incorporated in another device and is compliant with the FCC rules on its own, independent of any host. Um, the next is the limited singular mod single modular transmitter. So um, this is uh, kind of like a single modular transmitter, except there is constraints. So it's either constrained to a specific host or constrained to specific um, conditions um, listed on the grant. Next is a split modular transmitter. So a split modular transmitter um, complies with uh, the rules for a singular, single modular transmitter, except that the radio and control elements are separated into different sections. So um, it, it also demonstrates compliance for a range of similar host types. Uh, lastly, there's the limited split modular transmitter, um, which also has constraints, so constrained to a specific host or associated conditions on the FCC grant. Um, so what is a, uh, how do I determine what, uh, if my module is a single modular transmitter? So the FCC has very specific rules on this. Um, there's eight um, requirements, um, one of which is uh, the radio frequency RF module needs to be shielded. Um, there's uh, also the antenna must be unique or permanently attached. So um, that's how you can determine if it's a single modular transmitter or a limited single modular transmitter. So uh, many products nowadays can, uh, are taking advantage of previously certified uh, wireless transmitter modules. Um, so these modules are FCC certified and they've already demonstrated compliance with FCC rules. So um, if we're going this route, we still need to be um, have uh, be fairly aware of the FCC regulations and have a good understanding of um, RF and EMC concepts and principles. So um, there's, why do we do this? Um, so there's some advantages to leveraging um, a previously certified module transmitter, and it can reduce some of the FCC's filing requirements. Um, but there's limitations um, if, if, uh, if we do this, um, such as we can't make any changes 
that affect the upper power or use a different antenna. So, um, so host product manufacturers are still responsible for the final compliance and they are responsible for following the uh, modules integration guidance. So if they don't follow that, then um, they're responsible for any additional equipment authorizations or testing of technical requirements that are not covered by the original modules grant. So for example, um, it's, it's a radio module, but if you're, uh, you're still responsible for the unintentional radiator part when you're integrating it into your host. So, um, so uh, your end product still has digital parts that are subject to the um, FCC's Part 15B requirements. Um, so if you're also integrating other transmitters into the host, that are not certified, then that's also something that uh, you're responsible for. So, um, so some of the considerations um, we've already mentioned: uh, separation distance. So, uh, there needs to be a minimum separation distance of twenty centimeters between the antenna and uh, a person's body. So, um, these are some things that. Um, antenna gain, Apple power, these are all things that need to be considered when performing the host integration. So um, again, it's still mandatory um, to account for all SCC compliance requirements and generally um, testing and certification will still be required. So moving forward, we're going to dive into the testing process. So the testing will vary depending on which uh, equipment authorization procedure is required. So for SDOC, um, the test lab doesn't even need to be FCC recognized or accredited. Um, but for certification, it has to be an FCC recognized and accredited testing laboratory. Um, so on the right, there the these are the uh, equipment um, measurement procedures. So uh, the FCC rules contains the requirements at test levels, um, but uh, on the right here, these are the standards and measurement procedures which contain the test methods. So what tests do we need to do? So for FCOC, uh, simply EMC emissions testing, um, immunity is not required in the United States. So just conducted in radiated emissions, that's uh, part 15B. And um, for the test samples, just one test sample, um, and it can just be the end user's operational mode. Um, it, it, we do need to have the other accessories and peripherals that make the system fully functional with all the um, operational ports populated. So for certification, there's not just the EMC emissions testing, but also RF testing, a consistent test such as um, occupied bandwidth, uh, maximum power, um, radius, radius spurious emission, as well as if it's in the 5 gigahertz DFS bands, then also dynamic frequency selection. So um, there's more testing involved, as well as um, RF exposure. So uh, if it's a portal device, meaning used close to the body, then um, SAR, specific absorption rate, measurement is required. Um, if it's a mobile or a fixed use, then um, an MPE calculation is required. Um, so for the samples, um, it's conducted and radiated. So uh, two samples, but depending on the technologies involved, um, maybe more. So um, the samples must enable continuous transmission mode over the full spectrum of modulation. And for the conducted sample, um, either the original antenna has to be disconnected or replace with an external SMA connector to do the conducted measurement. Um, for the radiated sample, um, the original antenna can be attached. Um, for both, uh, the test firmware should be available to control the radio. So here's a general guideline for the lead time and the test samples needed. Um, it's not a fixed, um, so basically it depends on the complexity of the equipment, the different interfaces, the different radio types. So um, if it's a composite device, meaning it has more than one radio technology, such as Wi-Fi and Bluetooth together, that will take longer. If it's used close to the human body, then SAR may be required. Um, if it's using a 5 gigahertz DFS band, then DFS testing may be required. Um, obviously, if there's any issues and it's failing, then troubleshooting also takes uh, time. 
So um, the test samples in general, um, we need to cover all the different um, radios that it supports. So if one sample can only support one functionality, then we'll need multiple samples to cover all the different functionalities. Um, in general, it's one sample for a conducted measurement and one for the radiated measurement. And now we'll move on to the actual approval process. So for the SDOC, it's quite simple. Um, the responsible party just needs to um, warrant that each unit of equipment complies with the rules that apply to the equipment, um, maintain the documents to demonstrate the compliance, um, prepare the compliance information statements um, to be supplied with the product, um, and the responsible party must be in the United States. So the certification approval process, the manufacturer starts by obtaining the FCC registration number. So it's a uh, FRN for the device requiring certification. It's a 10 digit number used to identify the organization um, for, uh, for listing the information on the FCC website. Um, so the grantee code is also required. Um, this is part of the FCC ID. So it's um, the grantee code and a product code. Um, so the, for the first time applying for certification, um, a grantee code is necessary, but it can be used in the future for all um, approvals, um, or you can get another grantee code. So the product codes are unique for each product um, approved by the TCB. Um, it's a 14, al 14 digit alphanumeric um, code. So uh, after that, the responsible party um, needs to file an application with a uh, telecommunication certification body um, for a grant of certification. So um, this requires a submission of information about the product um, and a review um, of all this information. Um, once all the reviewing is done, then um, the results are evaluated to determine compliance with FCC's requirements. And lastly, the certification body will make a decision on uh, whether to certify the product or not, and finally upload all the required documentation into the FCC's database. So this becomes public. And lastly, um, a grant of certification is issued by the TCB um, through the FCC's database system. So the certification process, um, it's a TCB review um, consisting of an administrative review, a technical review, and a final certification decision. So once we, um, once the TCB re receives all the required information, then um, we determine if all the documents are there, it's complete, accurate, um, and then after that, pass it to the technical reviewer to process um, and determine if the, the test data and test reports satisfy the requirements. Um, and then lastly, a certification decision is made um, and the grant is issued. So what documents are required? Um, 731 form is an application form. Agent authorization letter is to authorize the third party to um, sign the application on behalf of the applicant. Um, confidentiality request letter to request confidentiality to some of the exhibits in this list. Um, user manual, operational description, schematic block diagram. Um, uh, equipment photos, uh, test setup, um, example of where the label will be placed, um, and then test reports, uh, exposure report. So um, some other things that aren't in this list, um, for license brand equipment, a tune-up procedure parts list will be required. Um, uh, modular approval letters are required for um, equipment, uh, for modular radio module transmitter equipment. Um, for software-defined radios, um, there also needs to be a document describing the security of the software-defined radio um, and other cover letters depending on the type of application. Um, on the right, there's a grant of certificate. So, um, so we've seen uh, applicants thinking that they've um, obtained some FCC approval when they received something that wasn't this grant. So this is what the grant looks like. And next, we'll be talking about labeling requirements. So under the SDOC um, labeling requirements, 
So the product identification requirement is that the product should have a unique identification number. It could be a model number, or serial number, um, compliance information, such as statements um, that the product complies with the applicable rules, name, address, contact information of the responsible party. Um, and actually the FCC logo is optional. Um, the logo can be included in the user manual or as part of the e-label. Um, e-labeling is allowed for devices with integrated displays. And um, actually something important not on here is the user manual um, must have statements to caution the user that uh, changes or modifications that haven't been approved by the responsible party um, can void the user's authority to operate the equipment. So um, changes, uh, which we'll cover in a later slide, must be communicated to the uh, certification body. So under certification, um, what's required for the label, uh, FCC ID consisting of the grantee and product code, warning statement. Um, so if the device is small, uh, that can be placed in the user manual. Um, labeling, uh, the label should be permanently affixed to the uh, equipment and uh, visible to the purchaser at the time of purchase. Um, and it can also be displayed electronically. So, um, and also the manual must contain statements saying that the unauthorized changes um, may void authority of operation. And on the right there is an example label of a uh, part 15 device. Okay, now we'll talk about the responsibilities of the applicant and also surveillance. So the responsibility of the applicant uh, maintain all the documentation as part of the responsibility uh, for the retention of the records and to ensure that the products are still in compliance. Um, also uh, retain the records for uh, if requested by the FCC. Um, these need to be provided within, I believe, 21 days. Um, so um, even after uh, discontinuing of marketing of the product, the records should still be retained for a one year period. Importation of radio frequency equipment requires that the product either has the required FCC equipment authorization through SDOC or certification, um, is only being imported for evaluation purposes, or if it's just a demonstration at a trade show. Um, and uh, those are the requirements for STOC and certification, as we mentioned before. So the FCC does have the right to request samples for inspection and submission of the equipment for testing. Um, if there's any non-compliance found, then the grant that was issued can be revoked and the equipment authorization can be withdrawn, meaning that uh, the equipment can't be sold, imported, or marketed in the United States anymore. So applicants should always be ready to have production samples available upon request by either the TCB or by FCC. Now we'll talk about permissive change and what to do when the product is modified. So a general rule of thumb is um, anything that causes uh, degradation of the data reported to the FCC requires a new filing. So um, class one permissive change, there's three classes, class one, class two, and class three. So class one means um, the equipment doesn't degrade the data reported to the FCC, um, meaning the performance characteristics, so the radio, um, output power, things like that are not any worse. Um, class two uh, equipment changes that do degrade the data reported to the FCC. So some examples, um, a new antenna where uh, there's a higher antenna gain or um, there's new uh, conditions of use. Um, so the RF exposure conditions change or when um, there's a co-location situation that was not previously addressed in the uh, original application. Um, class three permissive changes for changes for software defined radio equipment. Now we'll briefly touch on some of the new things that the FCC presented this year. So pre-approval guidance has always been around. Um, so that's where devices are subject to special conditions where um, the FCC themselves need to approve um, prior to the TCB approving. Um, so that can be one of the situations or in other circumstances, the FCC needs to actually do testing prior to the TCB approving the product. 
Um, devices can also be subject to unique installation, um, which require FCC review. So what's new is the new pre-approval guidance of reuse procedure allowed for, um, for hack, uh, software-defined radio, DFS, and certain ARF exposure items um, on the pre-approval guidance list. So this means um, based uh, approval based on a prior um, approved pre-approval guidance. So um, meaning the same conditions must apply to reuse that procedure. And the TCB may uh, continue the approval and uh, uh, issue the grant without uh, FCC review. And this has uh, been effective since May 1st. So this is important because um, some devices using the DFS bands, for example, um, or citizen broadband radio services, um, uh, UNI devices, DFS, uh, these are the main ones that are pretty popular and also still require the approval guidance. So um, approval using the new reuse procedure will uh, make the um, approval uh, lead time much shorter. So that covers all the topics we have today. Um, hopefully it was fairly helpful. Uh, it should cover all the main topics, uh, main concepts for equipment authorization uh, for FCC. So thank you for your time. Um, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please send them to info at vista-compliance.com. Uh, Vista Labs is an EMC and RF compliance test lab and uh, globally recognized product certification body. So if you have any um, product specific inquiries or questions or any issues you're stuck on, feel free to send us an email at info at vista-compliance.com and we'll try and get back to you and um, come up with a solution as soon as possible. So again, thank you for your time and join us for our webinar next month where we'll go over uh, South America um, type approvals and market access. Thank you and have a nice day.